Good evening. evening. Thank you. Welcome to Grace tonight. It's good to see all of you, and thank you to everyone watching on Facebook. The Lord certainly has blessed us with some beautiful weather the last few days, a sign of spring, and Easter's coming soon, so lots of of things for uh, which uh, we can give God thanks and praise and rejoice. So, and this is one of them, to be able to gather and hear his word and, and uh, uh, sing hymns to him and uh, to rejoice in one another's company. So thank you for being here. Um, in our um, service today, we'll again be using the, uh, the insert, as you know, um, for, the, uh, for the order of service, and then the, the larger insert, which is tucked into my pulpit over there, for the sermon hymn. So just hang on to those. And you'll notice um, for today we'll be using Psalm 27, and the psalms, again, are found in the front portion of the uh, hymnal, and we'll recite the psalm uh, responsively by whole verse. So again, thank you for being here. God's blessings to all of you. And we'll begin our service this evening with our opening hymn, number 420, Christ, the Life of All the Living. Thou, Lord, hast borne 
that as I now mightest own me, and with heavenly glory crown me. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto Thou hast suffered men to bruise thee, that from pain I might be free. Falsely did thy foes accuse thee, then I gain security. Comfortless thy soul did languish, me to comfort in my anguish. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto Thee. Thou hast suffered great affliction, and hast borne it patiently. Even death by crucifixion fully to atone for me. Thou didst choose to be tormented that my doom should be prevented. Thousand, thousand things shall be Dearest Jesus, unto Thee. Then for all that wrought my pardon, for Thy sorrows deep and sore, for Thine anguish in the garden, I will thank Thee evermore. Thank Thee for Thy groaning, sighing, for Thy bleeding and Thy dying, for that last triumphant cry, and shall praise Thee, Lord, on high. Please stand. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our Again, we'll read Psalm 27 responsively by whole verse. I'll begin with the first. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. 
He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from Leviticus, chapter 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Acts chapter 22. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, Paul, and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Please stand. And a reading from Matthew chapter 26. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. You may be seated. We continue with our next hymn, Break Your Hearts. from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1996, the Summer Olympic Games were held in Atlanta, Georgia. People from all over the world, as is customary with any Olympics, I think, aren't the Olympics being held this year? They were supposed to be held last year in Tokyo, and then with the pandemic they got postponed, so I think they're scheduled for this year. Well, anyways, in 1996, they had the Olympics in Atlanta, and athletes from all over the world gathered to compete in all variety of games and such. But 
What's remembered most about those Olympics, if you recall them from 25 years ago, wasn't so much the athletic contests, what happened in the stadiums and arenas and so forth, rather something tragic that took place outside of one of them. Eight days into the games, Eric Rudolph detonated pipe bombs at Centennial Olympic Park. The blast killed one person and injured 111 others. It was the first of four bombings committed by this man, Eric Rudolph, over the course of about 18 months. He eluded capture for years until he was finally found and arrested in North Carolina in 2003, and two years later he pleaded guilty to the bombings. But before anyone had heard of Eric Rudolph, the FBI had identified an Atlanta security guard named Richard Jewell as a person of interest, largely because he kind of fit the profile of what they thought would be a lone bomber, kind of a you know, a little bit different, kind of loner, out of the ordinary guy who was interested in police work and had a little bit of a checkered past and didn't have a lot of friends, and, and they, they honed in on him. The media had a field day with it, portraying him as a failed law enforcement officer who may have planted the bomb just so that he could find it and then be um, proclaimed a hero. It was all false witness, however. Now, as an aside, a few summers ago, near where my parents live in California, there were a whole bunch of these small wildfires, not these like huge ones that you saw in the news um, uh, back in the fall, but just all these little ones that were popping up. Even when we were there, you know, you'd see the helicopters and stuff trying to put out these little fires. And well, it turned out that this same man would show up to each of the fires. He was very helpful. He wanted to, to help the fire uh, fighters, and he had equipment and so forth. Well, pretty soon the, they suspected that maybe this man was the one actually starting the fire, and sure enough, when they did some investigating, it, they found out it was so. But not so with this Atlanta security guard named Richard Jewell. Once the dust settled in Atlanta, it was clear that Jewell was, in fact, a hero. He had spotted the suspicious backpack. He had called attention to it. He had helped to push people away from the blast, sparing the lives of many, many people. Without a doubt, many more people would have been killed and injured if it wasn't for his heroic work. Unfortunately, however, the damage had already been done to his reputation when he was falsely accused of being the one who had planted that bomb. His name had been forever connected to the Olympic bombing, and if you ask people a few years later after the bombing who was the, what was the name of the bomber, they were likely to say Richard Jewell. I don't know if you saw it, but there was a movie a few years ago that came out by that name, Richard Jewell, directed by Clint Eastwood that tells this story. Perhaps his movie will help to rehabilitate uh, his reputation a little bit. But unfortunately, Richard Jewell died in 2007, so he won't be able to benefit from it. Yes, false witness is awful. The Eighth Commandment is simple. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, we often think of this commandment in terms of not spreading gossip about other people. And that's certainly true. As Martin Luther explains in the small catechism, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. That's true. But while this commandment certainly applies to our private conversations with other people, in its simplest meaning, it has to do also with what is said in public, most specifically in a court of law. 
And this is exactly what we see happening in tonight's Gospel reading from Matthew. Our Gospel reading takes us to a dark place. Jesus has been betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. The temple guards have seized him and hauled him to Caiaphas, the high priest. The Jewish religious authorities have gathered to see and hear Jesus. They've decided that they're going to have to have him killed, presumably in order to protect their own power and position. And they are determined to complete the task by any means necessary, including by false witness. Matthew writes, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Listen to that sentence again. Now the chief priest and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. They were actively looking for somebody to offer lies about Jesus under oath for the sole purpose of having him killed. How evil must a person be to be willing to seek out false testimony to kill another person? But then it gets worse. Matthew continues, They found none, though many false witnesses came forward. It just sounds awful, doesn't it? This is one of the, a little aside here, this is one of the reasons why these Lenten services are, are so helpful, I think, because it, it helps us to focus in on, on what happened to Jesus and, and the details of it. I've talked about this before. It's, it's easy, I do it all the time, to say Jesus died for my sins without really considering what that all meant for Jesus. How awful it must be, how evil must it be for someone to be willing to offer false testimony against another person, knowing full well that it's intended to lead to his or her death. Well, these actions are certainly evil, and they clearly conflict with the Eighth Commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor includes, first and foremost, not bearing false witness in a court of law against another person. So yes, it's easy for us to see the sin of false witness that comes out in Jesus' trial. But it might be harder for us to see how this sin applies to us. Since I don't think any of us have committed perjury in a court proceeding, and certainly not going so far as to lie under oath for the purpose of having somebody killed. None of us have done that. But Luther, as he does so well, stretches our understanding of the commandment, and in doing so shows how it applies to us and brings the weight of the law down upon us. The commandment, Luther says, forbids all sins of the tongue by which we may injure or offend our neighbor. He writes in the large catechism, It is a common pernicious plague that everyone would rather hear evil than good about their neighbors. Even though we ourselves are evil, we cannot tolerate it when anyone speaks evil of us. Instead, we want to hear the whole world say golden things of us. Yet we cannot bear it when someone says the best things about others. Our false testimony often consists of the rumors and innuendos that we utter about other people. The whispered, did you hear? The murmured, you're not going to believe what I just found out. It just so easily slips off our tongue when we talk with other people. Those half-truths and sometimes outright lies we speak about others without ever directly speaking to them. The slander and backbiting we too often delight in sharing. Luther boils it down like this. No one shall use the tongue to harm a neighbor, 
whether friend or foe. Rather, we should use our tongue to speak only the best about all people, to cover the sins and infirmities of our neighbors, to justify their actions, and to cloak and veil them with our own honor. Our chief reason for doing this is the one that Christ has given in the gospel and in which he means to encompass all the commandments concerning our neighbor. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. We call this the golden rule. And of course, we know that we should follow it. However, we must admit that too often we don't follow it. We break it. We break the commandments of God, including the Eighth Commandment, and we know that we're deserving of punishment for it, namely death and eternal damnation in hell. But my friends, God calls you to a different path and to a different future. He invites you to return to him. He invites you to turn and leave behind your sins of false witness and all your other sins and see that he has something entirely new and different for you. He wants you to know, first of all, that Christ endured all of that false witness in Jerusalem. Not just the false witness, the mockery, the beating, the torture, the being nailed to the cross. He bore all that for you to reconcile you to God and to win for you the forgiveness of all your sins. All your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow because of the sacrifice of your Savior, Jesus, for you. And second, God empowers you then to speak the best about others, to help protect their reputations and to always put the best construction on everything, as Luther tells us. That's what Paul did after his road to Damascus conversion, as we heard in our second reading for tonight from Acts, when Paul was empowered to turn from his own false witness of Jesus, his own persecution of Jesus and of his people, to speak the very best about our Lord and Savior and his church. My friends, God did it for Paul and he will do it for you too. My friends, you can do this, and more than that, you get to do this, all because of what Jesus has done for you. So return to the Lord your God. Receive his love and forgiveness. Turn aside from your sins and serve the Lord with all your heart. You belong to him. He will never lie to you or deceive you. He will never bear false witness against you. No. He loves you. And you are his dear child forever. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Let my prayer rise before you as incense And the lifting up of my hands As the evening sacrifice My soul magnifies the Lord And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold from this day all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things to me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered. 
scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. Has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, in you we find the truth about our world and our lives. Spare us from the ravages of false witness. And when we fall, lift us up again and lead us to Jesus, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We pray this through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Faithful God, through the ancient prophets, you call us to return to you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let this Lenten tide be a time when, remembering how you relentlessly return to us in mercy, we return also to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy counsels, all good from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works. Give to us your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our final hymn is 890, O Blessed Light, O Trinity.
light into 